I'm Vivian Ming. I am a theoretical neuroscientist. I founded a bunch of companies. Uh, I run a philanthropic lab now to help people. And every good thing I've done in my life, I did after I transitioned to become who I am today. Hello, Out Bosses. Rhodes Perry here, and welcome to this week's episode of The Out Entrepreneur, a weekly podcast where I get to interview today's most inspiring LGBTQ bosses crushing it in business. So we're bringing back Dr. Vivian Ming, who was originally featured on episode 143. So I highly recommend you check that episode out and then give this one a listen. So Vivian is a theoretical neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and author. She co-founded Socos Labs, her fifth company, a mad science incubator. The think tank is far from mad, however, as she and her wife provide guidance to clients on how to use AI and neuroscience to enhance hiring practices, the treatment of employees, and better ways to support students. In her free time, Vivian has invented AI systems to help treat her diabetic son, predict manic episodes, and bipolar sufferers weeks in advance, and reunited orphan refugees with extended family members. She sits on the boards of numerous companies and nonprofits, including an out entrepreneur favorite, which is Start Out. So Vivian, welcome back to the show. A lot has changed since the last time we connected, which was 30 episodes ago. The world is, is very different. We've got large-scale racial justice uprisings and the global pandemic. So everything from how we connect with our community and our work is just very different. And I'm wondering, you know, recognizing that Socos Labs exists to solve really challenging problems. How have these recent events impacted your company? And, you know, what role, if any, is your company playing right now to address any of these, these major, major challenges? Yeah, so we, we got blindsided as much as anyone else. You know, the one thing you mentioned, we help our clients. Well, the vast majority of our clients do not pay us a dime. Uh, they are just simply people that need help. And even those that do do so with the caveat of knowing that I'm going to tell them whatever I want to tell them anyways. So be forewarned, I certainly am not going to help them come up with a new blockchain strategy. What I'm interested in is how do we be, help people be the best person they can be and do that at a global scale, change the life of 8 billion people because that's the easiest thing strange as it may sound, I can do to make my kids' life better. They already have a pretty good life. Helping other people, it's far and away the best thing I'm ever going to do as a mom. So, well, I guess coming up with an AI to treat my son's diabetes is probably up there somewhere, <laughs> but I'm, I'm proud of that one. <laughs> Having said that, you know, uh, other than the good fortune of my life, I do fly around the world and I visit with countries and companies. I, I just briefed NATO. Again, I'll talk to anyone if they're willing to hear what I have to say. And, you know, we talked about cyborgs. If you're wondering what the military is thinking about nowadays, cyborgs are on their mind. Mm -hmm. And I, I fly, I would have been in Bangalore and Singapore, London, uh, Johannesburg. I, I'd have gone around the world a couple of times by now. And every one of those visits would have funded a project mm -hmm. that we do at the lab. And of course, you know, overnight of the course from early March to the end of March, it just all disappeared. Yeah. And so one thing I appreciate is I founded a number of companies before this. This may not be the best example of a good business I've ever been involved in since there is no guaranteed revenue stream of any kind other than my bank account. But nonetheless, we run it as a small business and the small business with a global reach, which makes it really fun. So I am instantly familiar. Every restaurant owner that is wondering how do I keep my employees employed, everyone that is genuinely looking at like existentially, uh, not just my company, my, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to have a future? Everything I put into is in this and just overnight it's gone. I, I think the, the numbers out of New York was that when this is all done, something like 40 to 60 percent of all small and medium sized businesses in New York City will be gone. So I made a commitment. One of the things I study people's long-term life outcomes. If, I, if there was any variable that cuts across every single dimension of my work, it is how do we maximize people's long-term positive life outcomes? 
And the one thing I know from that research is if you lose your job during a recession, this isn't just bad economically. It doesn't mean it's a career setback. For example, during the 81, 82 recession, and if you weren't alive back then, screw you. How dare you be younger than me? But if you were and you lost a job, your chance, what, what's called all-cause mortality, your risk of dying went up by eight points just because you were out of work during that recession. In fact, you know, we're talking about COVID-19 right now. We went ahead and built an economic model and we looked at the cost of COVID if we do nothing, which is horrific, but also the cost of COVID if you, in a sense, if we do everything. You know, we don't come up with a sophisticated plan. We just lock down and do, we hide in our bunkers. And it, our estimate was over the long haul, next 30 years, 16 people will die for every life saved. So, you know, it's, it's in phil philosophy, there's this classic thing called the trolley problem. If you watched The Good Place, they had a whole episode, a very funny episode about the trolley problem where, you know, you go down one track and you hit one person or you can switch tracks and, and or sorry, you hit five people and you switch tracks, you can only hit one person. But of course, then in some sense, you own the moral responsibility of killing that one person versus yeah. the five if you did nothing. Well, the whole world boarded a trolley about six months ago. <laughs> and it is rushing down the track. It's hitting people on both sides of this track at this point. We, we, we're stupidly on a giant trolley. It's going down both ends of a bad track. My, my work in the economic side of COVID is neither lockdown versus do nothing. It is, there is a rational plan that where people put in the political will. And I mean, you as a citizen listening to this all the way up, to the couple of people that I hope and suspect will be the next president and vice president. And they actually spend the political capital and say, here are the hard things we are going to do. It will be hard now. I know it sounds hard that we all lock down, but in fact, that's easy. It's politically easy because you just do it the same to everybody rather than coming up with a really detailed plan. So we even modeled those plans out. I'm not going to go into it because it turns out a bunch of finely detailed agent modeling of economic outcomes is just not that interesting <laughs> for a podcast. But we went through and looked at all this, and we're not the only ones. Economists at MIT and here at UC Berkeley have done this as well. If we, if we really paid the political capital, did the hard things, we'd save lives and we'd save money. Uh, so, you know, my commitment to my employees was if I let them go, I would hurt the entire rest of their lives. All of my employees are young. They're all early in their career. So I, I just decided, you know, I'm going to essentially increase my family by 10 people, pay their rents for a while. I didn't know it would be six months, but I can stick it out for a long time. And we're going to keep going. And one of the side benefits is all the rest of my work gets to keep going as well. You know, as long as I'm willing to keep running that and, Occasionally now and then I do get invited to give remote talks and so forth. And that helps a bit, but really it just was a decision that the right thing to do right now was the hard thing. Uh, it was to lose a lot of money, but when this is all done, my life will be great again. And that won't be true of the young people working for me. So that was my commitment. We did one other thing that I think is really interesting. We built a predictive model of COVID spread. So as, as some people probably heard, it's, it's what wonks like me would call highly heterogeneous. We don't all spread the same. We're not all at the same risk. So if you really model that difference between people, how much at risk are you? How much are you at risk of spreading, at risk of dying? You, if you model that out, it turns out you can actually identify likely spreaders, both mm -hmm. people and places pretty easily. Yeah. And then if you basically just went to them and say, hey, you know what, I, I'll pay you money to just stay home. Yeah. I, I will pay a little bit of money, whatever it costs your bar to be open. Mm -hmm. I will pay you that money to stay closed or better yet to do something different. How about you send all your employees to Khan Academy or uh, Coursera to learn some new skills? I'll pay you to do it because we will dramatically cut down on the spread. So it was really cool being able to, we took this model where we actually looked at communication patterns inside companies and we looked at information diffusion and innovation and, and sort of neat ideas in a completely different side of my life. And we were able to use it 
to predictably track COVID spread and yeah. coronavirus two spread. And it was, it was a lot of fun putting it together. But again, it's one of those hard things. You mm-hmm. have to be willing to do a hard thing like pay someone who's not sick, pay someone before they become sick. But we weren't the first people to come up with this idea. Long before COVID came along, people have been doing models like this to prevent outbreaks in Africa of other types of diseases. And it mm-hmm. works really well. But yeah. you've got to be willing to really front up. And But, you know, we've spent, we're down $15 trillion in our economy right now. Mm-hmm. Something tells me we could have taken less than a trillion and prevented all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest thing, right? Like, I love the work that you do because it is, it's super innovative. It sounds so much fun and it's very proactive. And I think that that sometimes can be hard for, I guess, maybe government agencies in particular, leaders of of those agencies that tend to operate in a more reactive type of way until the fire happens. That's when action is inspired. So I really love what you're doing. I also love that you have that commitment to keeping your team together. And it just reminds me of that Simon Sinek quote that, you know, give people what they want and they'll like you for now, give people what they need, you know, that spirit of equity and they'll value you forever. And that kind of loyalty that you will generate with your team and the things that you'll continue to innovate in the future. And I just, I love talking with you because I know I I learn so much every time. I want to pivot because... So for folks, you know, we've got the video going on right now and you've got a number of different posters in the background and you're describing that these are, you know, your kind of movie posters of the projects that you work on at Socos. And one of them is The Tax on Being Different, which is one of two books in the midst of everything going on. Somehow you're you're publishing two books this year that you're going to you're going to be releasing. And I am super excited for this particular book. So I'm hoping that you could share a little bit more about, you know, what the book is about, why you wrote it, how it might help our audience in particular understand this tax as it relates to being an LGBT entrepreneur. Absolutely. The tax on being different. Um, I'll, I'll say as a bit of a background, when I was a graduate student, my advisor in grad school said to me what his advisor way back when said to him, which is science is a story. And that story should be about an hour long. Um, But, you know, at its heart, he didn't just mean, or at least I didn't take it to mean you should be able to give a really good talk. It was actually doing science as a story, the whole piece of it. So at Socos Labs, on top of doing the work, we write up what we call episodes. So if you visit Socos.org, you can see those episodes. Um, You know, we don't charge anything. And they're just little, it's the story of us doing our work. It's very fun. You know, there's an A story and a B story. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, here's how we got here. And then you come back and we get to be the the uh, very imperfect heroes of every story. And unfortunately, sometimes we're failed heroes in some of those stories because you don't always come up with a good solution to a problem. But we really wanted to frame it as a story because that's what doing science is. And one of those stories started... I was the chief scientist of this company called Guild. We probably talked about that a bit in our last interview. And I got a call, a call from a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. So back then, I I just had, I'd had the good fortune of being on the cover of the, the New York Times and the Atlantic and all this stuff. And suddenly, all these reporters are calling me with these questions about jobs, inclusion, and AI. That's pretty much what I do. That's I'm a one-trick pony. I try and solve every single problem in the world with artificial intelligence. Turns out not every problem is solvable that way, but sometime I will force a cube into every circle. So what this person asked was, hey, there's this guy named Jose Zamora, and he published a blog post claiming that he, no one was responding to his resumes. So he drops the S out of his name, and now an identical resume, but labeled Joe Zamora, was getting a whole bunch of job requests, that uh, interview requests that Jose was never getting. So they're asked me is, Dr. Ming, is this plausible? Do you really believe that this is true? Now, I bet everyone listening right now knows about what's sometimes called the name on a resume research. So put a male or female name on a resume, put an African-American sounding name versus a Caucasian sounding name on a resume. And suddenly people treat otherwise identical resumes totally differently. A nice fun little variant of that is socioeconomic status. So put on a resume and everything's the same, that even the names 
but you have something like at Yale, I was a member of the Yachting Club, mm-hmm. or at Yale, I was a participant in a student work program. And suddenly pe- people treat you differently because of your perceived background, which see, this is really fascinating. Sorry, it's a little bit of a detour, really this fascinating. And it's in the book yeah. for elite law firms coming from a wealthy background means you're much more likely to get a job interview mm-hmm. than if there's an implication you came from a poor background. But it actually flips for women. Women from a, that look like they were there on scholarship are actually just as likely as men that look like they were at Yale on scholarship to get that job interview, whereas wealthy background women were actually the least likely of all to get an interview. And astonishingly, in actual follow-up interviews with the law firms, I said, rich women don't need to work. They're going to mm-hmm. come here. We're going to put all this money to training them, and then they're going to get a husband and disappear on us, mm-hmm. which you know, you can imagine how devastating it is to someone that worked incredibly hard all their life, earned a position at an elite law school, got this interview, or at least the potential for it. And then, and I've been there. I mean, this hair does not get a VC to invest in my companies. You know, I've had people ask me who the technical co-founder of my company was. I've had so many VCs tell me they have the perfect CEO. By the way, I'm the CEO of the company. So literally telling me, I'll fund you if I can fire you on day one. And it's, you know, if you see that, that before you, once you make money, everything changes. It's not like sexism goes away, but suddenly people start calling you. They want to fund your companies. But that first time out, you're Mm -hmm. building a company. And whether it's a high growth startup with venture funding or you are doing a corner store and you're just looking for a loan. Uh, who you are, uh, sexuality, gender, gender expression, all of it. Trust me, at some level, a person in control of money is taking that into account, making a bad decision, including trusting you too much because you're a straight white guy. You know, I used to be one of you. Please don't think I don't think well of straight white guys, but, yeah. you know, we have an implicit benefit of the doubt given, and it it is often unjustified. And yet, you see this bias kind of built into American culture. So, sorry, what a detour. So I get this call from this reporter. And I thought, you know, the most frustrating thing is that they have to ask. I can now say in retrospect, that particular paper, USA News and World Reports, has dozens and dozens of news stories about the very research I'm talking about. But, you know, news reporters either pretend or actually have the memory of mayflies. And so every news story has no context, no background, yeah. uh, and you just approach it cold. And mm-hmm. so I thought, how can I do this differently? No one wants to hear research. Like mm-hmm. in our world today, unfortunately, a huge percentage of people just are not convinced by research. Yeah. I think part of it is numbers really don't convince much of anyone. And there does need to be a story and there does need to be heart behind what you're saying. Then you follow it up with head. But in this particular case, I thought, how could I make it different? So I had this data set of 122 million people. And I thought, what if I grab every single Joe and every single Jose in my data set? And remember, my secret trick is artificial intelligence. So we built this company to try and predict who would be good at their job, specifically to take bias out of hiring. Now, we were wildly imperfect. But I still think we were one of the best companies of that, that even to date, there's been very little progress from what we accomplished to whatever it was almost 10 years ago now. And in this particular case, we had this data set. So I could say, let's equate all those Joes and Jose's, no apples and oranges. Our predictor says they're just as good at their job. So what does Joe need? What does Jose need to get the same probability of promotion for the same quality of work as Joe? And then, of course, we'll, we can extend that. What does Jane need compared to Joe? What do you need if you are a gay man in the UK compared to a straight man in the UK or black man on Wall Street? So we were able to run these models and actually come up with answers. In the case of Joe and Jose, we found there's about three quarters of a million dollars in additional work. He had to get, for example, a master's degree when Joe didn't need a degree at all. Just to get the same probability of a promotion, he has to work longer at the same company, has to go to a more elite university. Again and again, you find all this additional effort, this additional friction. And it may sound subtle. I mentioned being gay in the UK. That was one of the few cases where, you know, the, the 
overwhelming number of people in that data set were white. Their sexuality is not obvious the moment they walk in the door. You'd think, is there really something to measure there? I mean, many of them might well have been closeted. I have very fancy, fancy secret techniques for pulling out these identities. And nonetheless, there was a measurable difference. Even though this was not an observable quality about someone, we could measure a difference. And here's one thing here back in the States that I thought was really fascinating. I had a hypothesis. What if I was born in Dallas, grew up a young gay kid in Dallas, or someplace notionally more accepting? I was born and raised in Seattle. Then both hypothetical people moved to New York City, a notionally accepting locale. is there a measurable difference in their career outcomes, even though their entire careers are in the same place and accepting city? And the way we do it is we, we use some HRC index information and we sort of label non-inclusive cities and inclusive cities, and then we can aggregate all of them, all the movements and all of this so forth. And it turns out not a lot of gay people move from inclusive cities to non-inclusive cities. It happens, but... Most go in the other direction. So we can track all of these pairs of people moving. And even there, it's subtle. It is a very subtle, but there's a headwind. Mm-hmm. That kid who grew up in Texas, you know, and they have to assume it's been internalized at this point. It's not so much the rest of society, but an idea that someone like me can't be successful. Mm-hmm. And then it, it slows you. You slow yourself down because culture has taught you not not quite as much to believe in yourself. And I happen to be a neuroscientist, so studying what's called neuroeconomics, you know, the way certain parts of your head, your parietal lobe, sort of back towards the back area, there are parts of your brain that are really seem to be doing some calculations. Is this choice worth it? Is this job going to be a big effort that doesn't pay off? And a lot of that gets formed early in your life. And if you get taught just by exposure, no one like me. I mean, imagine, you know, being someone that's gone through gender transition. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up, th- the only thing we were was the punchline of a sitcom. And that was the best case. You know, you were the, it's the football player that's a stripper now at the high school reunion sitcom episode, which, you know, one of the most shocking things is that's an actual episode in Will and Grace in the 90s, the show that was supposed to be the breakthrough yeah, thing. Right? And in fact, it had this terribly anti-trans episode in which they poke fun at, at, at uh, this woman as not being an actual woman. So, you know, you look at all these things and it's just amazing. We can go and measure. And I know dollars and cents aren't human life. Mm-hmm. But I, what I try and do, in fact, even that title, the tax on being different. We did all this work. We made all these measurements. And someone who is friends with the head of the uh, Jeb Bush presidential campaign, just to give you a sense of the timing on this, said, boy, you know, I think uh, Jeb would be really interested in hearing about this. Would you be interested in me setting up a chat? You know, back when people thought he'd be relevant. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, of course. And then I thought, how do I talk about bias? How do I talk about discrimination Mm -hmm. to what I believe in my heart is a well-intentioned conservative? Mm -hmm. Someone that might be able to get it if you can put it in a language that they understand. Yes. Well, they understand dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine there are some listeners here, because there certainly are among uh, queer communities, mm-hmm. that would self-identify as conservatives, perhaps mm-hmm. not so many Trumpian types, but, you know, old school, fiscally mm-hmm. responsible, and, you know, understanding that discrimination comes with a cost, not just the moral cost, which is real and it's, it's horrific, but there's a genuine economic cost in being able to say you know what? Discrimination is a tax. It's the dirtiest word in the conservative language. It's the tax on being different, which happens to be the tax, therefore, on being yourself. Uh, And yet, the parallel research from myself and so many others is being yourself, you actually produce more. Mm -hmm. So now we're taxing people for being more productive. Is there a more anti-conservative concept that has yeah. ever been pro- proposed. Yeah. It, it is absurd. And, and I just, I wanted to do a body of research mm-hmm. and then write a book that really laid it out. Why is it in all of our interests to make an inclusive economy? 
Yeah. I have a, a question related to this. So I love uh, I love your thinking around, okay, how do I talk about this concept to different audiences and thinking about different political ideologies? And it's brilliant, right? When we talked during the Belonging Network Summit, we were just kind of talking about, you know, the work that you do, how AI is replacing so many different jobs. And in that conversation, you talked about, you know, your prediction of the future, the more that we can show up as authentically as we want in our work, provided we can, that that is the differential that will allow us to stand out and continue to do what we love doing, right? So in your book, do you, you know, probably more towards the end, like, is there kind of the silver lining of that? Like, do you speak to that at all? So, uh, you know, this is the thing is, I see what could be really dismal, whether whether you look, so the other book is How to Robot Proof Your Kids, and that's yeah. my sort of look at AI and education and, and the future of work. And there you could look at everything that my research shows mm-hmm. and think, this is terrible. We're headed in a terrible direction. But I actually look at it and I see not a silver lining, like a platinum lining. If we yeah. could just lean into it and to make it as direct, but maybe impenetrable as possible, the future of work is that your value is you. Yeah. You know, I can make AIs, as many people can now, that can do incredibly sophisticated things, but it can only do the routine stuff. So some things that you might have to go to university for years to be able to learn how to do, I could train these systems up overnight. And if they can't do it quite as well as you, they can do it for a dollar a day. And mm-hmm. you can't live on a dollar a day. So you're not going to mm-hmm. underbid these AIs. So you, the, all that routine work, it doesn't go away, but it really morphs. It changes. It, it's what we call deprofessionalizes. Mm-hmm. And it shifts down uh, to a very much lower pay grade. What is uniquely valuable is what is uniquely you. So you know, imagine all the most unique jobs you can imagine, being an author, uh, being a film director, being a scientist, I like to believe, at least at, at all of these at some end of the economic ladder. Well, I want people to prepare for a world where those are the, the jobs, like that is it. You either do these deprofessionalized jobs where you're essentially an AI jockey, you're just running these machines, or you're a value add. Mm-hmm. Uh, we call it the creative economy. Yeah. And in that sense, where these two stories come together, the future of work and the tax on being different is, I want difference. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want people to be the same. Uh, I mean, I mean this in a selfish, economics-driven way. I want people to be as different as possible. Every subtle difference between us is a new perspective on the world. And that is your unique value add. Yeah. I want to hire you because you in particular will produce a different effect. So interestingly, I've been listening to this podcast. Uh, I probably shouldn't plug podcasts on other podcasts, That's but okay. very different uh, <laughs> audience, I suspect. Uh, it's called The Writer's Room. And it's yeah. about, as they say, the business and process of writing, particularly for television. Oh, and it's so fascinating because, um, you know, for the longest time, I thought I had this unique uh, way of hiring, which is you know, what I want to know is what you can uniquely produce. I need a value add. I need you to have had an idea I wouldn't have had. I can hire people to program or I can teach you how to do it. I can teach you how to do machine learning. I can teach you how to do neuroscience and, and psychology. The math is a little hard to pick up later in life, but I did. Anyone could in theory do all those things. The one thing I can't teach you to do is have an idea I wouldn't have had. So then I hear that again and again, showrunner after showrunner, the head writers that actually run shows in the U.S., showrunner after showrunner saying the only, you know, there's a million writers in L.A. The only reason I hire you is because you will have had an idea that I wouldn't have had. And you can then deliver on a deadline. That does matter (laughs) a little bit. So hearing that and knowing my son who has diabetes and autism in the world as I look at it has a huge advantage. He's going to see the world wildly different than everyone else, not for free. It was hard work to get through all this, but he'll be there. Me, because, well, I'm kind of a weirdo. No matter what had happened in my life, 
But the simple truth is, you know, while the transition, yeah, having lived as one life, lived as another offers perspective, the most valuable experience for me, which I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy was being homeless. Yeah. You know, being, getting to run around in these elite tech circles with uh, billionaires and, and political leaders, asking my opinions about things and knowing I'm probably the only post homeless person they may have ever talked to yeah. or at least asked for advice. Right. Like seriously, yeah. my company needs help. Person who used to live in your car, can you help us? How often does that happen? Now, again, I'm not wishing autism or diabetes or homelessness on anyone, mm-hmm. but we need to lean into being different. Obviously, I want to find commonalities. In fact, most of my work, sorry, I feel like I'm running a mile a minute here, but most awesome. of my work <laughs> is about, forgive a little bit of a wonky term, but it's about complementary diversity. Yeah. I want to find the team of people mm-hmm. who are all bring something unique to the table, but also fit together. Uh, that, you know, our research shows that that is the best. You should be hiring for that team. Don't hire for a person. Don't hire in the sense for arbitrary diversity, but blow it up on every other dimension, life experience, cultural, racial background, sexuality, skill levels, higher, low skill and high skill, have them work together. Uh, like every difference you can imagine, you want it there present. And here's the hard part. You want it courageous yeah. so that you're actually bringing that difference to the table. And that's maybe the hard ingredient of it all, which is society right now teaches most people. Um, I want everyone to get along. I don't need to be a jerk uh, ever. I, I am just naturally, but uh, I shouldn't be. And what I actually want, though, is for people to have the courage to say, you know what, Vivian, I, I think you're wrong. I, I think the thing we're writing in this chapter of the book uh, is off base, or I think there's a better component we can put into that model. That's what I need to hear. I don't need my employees ever to ask me what I want ever. Uh, And, and I know I bet every business leader knows what I'm saying, but what if that is the fundamentals of how we build whatever next America we're given after COVID after Trump, after we find some degree, I, you know, I, this is unsolicited, but the first time I ever saw an AI face recognition system ignore a black person, yeah. uh, literally just not detect them, there is no human being here, was 22 years ago. Mm-hmm. So for me, the idea that there is a shock to the idea that AI is biased or that America is biased. I'm like, what have we been living through for the last 500 years that yeah, didn't give yep. you a clue? <laughs> yes. And we can look along any number of political questions, ask ourselves that same question. It isn't that these things aren't obvious and they aren't clear. It's are we willing to actually pay the price to do something about them? Yes. And yeah. I guess I hope what all of my work says is whether we're talking about LGBTQ plus populations or anyone else in the world, this next moment in time may be our single best opportunity to truly pay that price. It will be a price. Don't let me tell you there's some better future tomorrow. 20 years from now, there's a better future. That's the future my kids are going to get that I'm going to pass on to them. And I'm going to work to that. Uh, and I would be thrilled to have some help. Yes, yes. Well, this is the segue that goes into some of the keynotes that you talk about. And one of them is looking at AI and civil rights, right? So this show definitely focuses on business, entrepreneurship, and we also touch on the importance of having access to equitable economic opportunities. So how, and, and I don't know if you you touch on this in, in your talks on on this particular topic, but how can AI be used for good when it comes to opening up more economic opportunities for LGBTQ and other marginalized business owners, if, if you work on that? And I'm yeah. sure you have lots of thoughts too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I, I have so many. And I can start with an example that in a sense, you may not think of as AI, but um, knowing a little something under the hood, there is in a way 
I, I used to travel a lot, as I said, I fly quite a bit and fly out of the country going through TSA and security and so forth. So I've got every fancy, fancy thing for every country I regularly visit. And you better believe America is first among them. And you know, one of the main reasons I have them isn't just to save me time. It's so that I don't have to go through a full body scanner. And the reason I don't want to go through a full body scanner is only in America. Only in America do I routinely get flagged, yeah. which essentially means I get somewhat innocently molested by a TSA agent because yeah. my hips are too narrow. Yeah. That's it. Uh, they actually aren't even aware of why the system's flagging me. Although mm -hmm. if you visit the TSA's website, they have an actual web page that basically says, eh, sorry. We know that this, the systems mischaracterize transgender people, but we don't care is the way I read it because, of course, they can fix it. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's flagging me effectively as a risk, right? Like, a, like I'm a terrorism risk because I have hips. narrow hips. Someone right. hit a button that said female and my hips are too narrow. Uh, I, I don't know how to take that. I think about if I built an AI system in my business. Mm -hmm. that that malfunctions like that, how embarrassed I would be. Yeah. So when I think a lot about how AI and, and any kind of technology gets used in the world, not only do I think about how it affects populations like mine, but I, I, as a producer, as a founder of companies and a producer of novel technologies and inventor, uh, I think about the bigger question. And you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting to me is Right now, really running machine learning at scale is, it's complicated. In theory, you could buy a bunch of computers, you could set them up with a backup power supply in your garage, you know, a la early Google or something, and you could develop all of your own code, but you're not going to. What you're going to do is you're going to go to Google Cloud or uh, AWS or possibly Alibaba, and you're going to use all of their servers, and you're going to use uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or one of these things produced by Facebook or Google or Amazon that already exist out there. So in other words, um, they're going to incredibly facilitate your business to do something amazing, but it will now be impossible for you to do anything without them. And I'm not saying this like in a dismal way, in the sense that I think they're snooping on us. I, I don't, but you have to understand, imagine how much of your business is dependent on what amounts to six companies and two countries keeping yeah. it all alive. Uh, and I don't know how many uh, listeners you have in Europe, but of course, this is a big issue for them there. They don't have, re realistically, they don't have any European-based options. Yes, there are European-based servers, but they're owned by Amazon and Alibaba and Google. Mm -hmm. uh, and all, so all of this is done um, by these big companies. And for me, I, I think it actually presents a real question of whether the field is balanced. If you're a small business owner working in cutting-edge technology, like the companies I work in, you're at a, a profound disadvantage right from day one that it's not really a level playing field. So it may sound really out there uh, to some people that are not part of this discussion, but for example, Fifi Lee, who's um, uh, this very famous uh, machine learning researcher at Stanford, and in fact, John Eschivetti, who's the, used to be the president of Stanford, have both written a policy paper co-authored by essentially everyone at Stanford saying there should be uh, essentially a public infrastructure for artificial intelligence. Yeah. So that small businesses, researchers, and even individuals can actually use this power themselves. And what am I saying here? I'm saying right now, in the time you've been listening to this, you have been passed over for a job. You have been passed over for a loan. You've been passed over, possibly if you have kids of the right age, uh, for college admissions. Uh, you have been snooped on by the police. You possibly, not right here at the moment, but you might have been uh, barred or flagged from crossing a border in certain countries, and you never knew it happened. And how do I know this? Because I built some of these things. Right. Uh, and, and I'm actually not talking about something that's secret or mysterious. It's just, it turns out AI can, let's say, analyze your loan risk mm -hmm. so efficiently. It's such a low cost. 
I don't have to wait for you to apply. Hmm. I can actually analyze you based on your public data and decide what kind of loan uh, my company should target at you, which means to say which kind of loan is going to make my bank the most amount of money. Yeah. Now, yeah. I might get a loan, but you have to understand now that's entirely in service of the other side yeah. uh, of a negotiation. And if they didn't give you a loan because you are transgender or you're gay or you're black or you're disabled, how would you ever know? You didn't even know you got passed over. Yeah. So having a civil right isn't a civil right if you have no means of exercising it. As, as we're probably all well aware right now, if you don't know that someone snooped on you, you can't actually bring a lawsuit against them. Right. So this is really complicated. And, you know, the way I put it, and, and I hope it doesn't put anyone to sleep, is I have the right to an attorney who is acting in my best interest. I have the right as a shareholder to a board that has fiduciary responsibility to me. I have the right to a doctor keeping my medical information in confidence. I have all of these civil rights. Some go as deeply as human rights. And uh, as crazy and science fictional as may seem, we desperately need a right to artificial intelligence acting in our individual self-interest. Uh, because right now it's not. And we already know it's biased. And I'm not, it's biased because it can be nothing but that. Right. I love AI. I spend every day building it. This is not a knock the AI talk. But instead, these things are fundamentally biased. They can never be one size fits all. If I'm going to have, let's up the stakes, if I'm going to have a parole hearing and the prosecutor and the judge are using an AI to advise them on whether I am a risk, a recidivism risk, a risk of reoffending, and such algorithms exist, and although they've fallen out of favor for some pretty good reasons, I strongly suspect they're still being used. Well, then I, as the person on the other side, I should have the right exactly the same way as I should have the right to my own expert witness. Well, this is my expert witness yeah. because yeah. there is no unbiased AI, just as there are no unbiased people. And I should have that right. So this is, mm. it's not, you know, it's not the cool talk about I built an AI that can predict my son's diabetes or an AI to help find orphan refugees. But this is the nitty gritty of where these amazing new technologies we're building can simultaneously improve our lives while also slowly eroding yeah. other fundamental parts of those lives. And I think we just need really open eyes when we recognize that that's happening. Absolutely. I mean, the talk that you're doing on that just, you know, it's a keynote, right? So you're, you're striking, you're striking a note to get people to start thinking about this. And what does, what does the human rights movement look like in the 21st century, factoring in all of these, from my perspective, probably not from yours, but newer technologies where it's like, this isn't even on the table. I mean, we're, we're still kind of focused on Black Lives Matter and kind of, you know, supporting large scale racial justice uprising in the streets. So kind of this is just like, it is the matrix behind the streets that is also a part of the game, right? But you, you can understand, as, as you may have seen in some of those stories, I, yeah. like, that, of course, that's really grounded. That a guy in a bunch of body armor with a weighted truncheon is a very real and immediate experience. And that yeah. needs to get addressed. But there's also a lot of facial recognition going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I've used facial recognition to help autistic kids uh, learn how to read facial expressions. I've used it to reunite orphan refugees with extended family members. I am not one of those people that's going to say ban all forms of facial recognition. But it is such an enormous power. Uh, imagine that a country can monitor the public square or possibly even into people's houses mm -hmm. with the fine detail that Mark Zuckerberg can manage your relationships on Facebook okay. by tracking your face, seeing your expressions, who you're meeting with. And if that sounds ludicrous, understand that is happening in some countries. Mm -hmm. And there are companies out there built to do this very thing. And to me, the point isn't, well, burn it all down, uh, elect people that will ban all these technologies. The real point to me is there's no balance of power. Maybe I'm, I'm really leaning into my Madisonian uh, American civics here, but yeah. we need a balance of power. And right now, uh, the roughly 300 million of us 
uh, that don't own a, you know, major massive corporation with some control over these technologies are reaping the positive benefits, but with very little say about the costs. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to start talking about those because by the time AI is played out the way the internet and data has been played out, or God forbid, go to the next stage of all this. I've got six neurotechnology companies in my portfolio. Elon Musk, Brian Johnson, who founded Braintree, and then a couple of my own companies, all working in essentially the next major data space, which is your brain. You really want you know, the pirates of Silicon Valley rampaging through your vein and, and grabbing this data isn't valuable to you, mm-hmm. but if we can use it, if we can add some value to it and then give you a little, mm-hmm. you know, even when we were talking about the internet, that sounded like mercantilism to me, you know, like Caribbean islands and natives living there, all of these plants and the w- good weather is not valuable to you. Let us take all of that sugar away. We'll turn it into rum. We'll sell it back to you. Mm-hmm. It worked great for colonial powers, not so good for the people that were buying the rum. And right. that's, I yeah. think, a pretty strong metaphor for what we've gotten on the internet to date. Yeah. Now AI, and yes, even neuroscience might be headed in mm-hmm. that direction too. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> that's just the dismal. I, I, um, I'm going back to my economics roots right now of like, oh, this is very dismal and, and not, right? Uh, and I think that for the work that you're doing, you know, and having the, you know, presenting this as a keynote, getting people to think, think about this more critically, you know, you're inviting in more folks to kind of have a say, like you said, and balance balance the power differentials right now. Well, it's definitely finding the balance is a big part. I, you know, let me again be super clear. Yeah. Uh, those companies are in my portfolios for reasons. Mm-hmm. I am on their board, their uh, advisors to them, because I'm doing a project for people that are locked in. They look like they're in a coma, but they can actually talk if you could just communicate with their brains. Kids that have traumatic brain injury, they've lost their working memory, they're the basic raw cognitive power and we're beginning to give it back to them. And I've got two companies working on neurodegeneration, dementia, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Those are things we want. I just, here's my, again, my platinum lining to this. I simply, I guess I don't want to believe or maybe refuse to believe that humanity is so irresponsible that we can never be trusted with any of these things. Mm-hmm. We can do good. We just need to pair it with the maturity of saying no to ourselves every now and then. Yes. Yes. So I, I want to shift just to give you, you are leading up Start Out Sport, and we were talking before the show about the Inclusion Impact Index. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to share a little bit more about that because our audience is primarily folks that Start Out really serves and benefits. Yeah. So one of the cool parts of my life is I get to work on so many different things. Well, you've probably gotten a sense now from my wonky neuroeconomic ethics rants <laughs> to uh, education and, and health and, and so many other things. So, you know, as a trans woman that's founded a number of companies, uh, I've often really wanted to, one, tell stories. Tell stories about gay founders and lesbians and and uh, bi and trans and intersectionality and the whole thing. Because again, when I was young, nobody liked me. Not in Congress, no business leaders, nobody. So how do we change that so that that's never true again? And you know, I know data, I know um, machine learning, I know economics, even though. Um, I'm sort of a dilettante at it. And I thought, what if we could collect all this data together? So I got some people to make some donations of data and the money to buy data from those people that wouldn't donate it. And we put together a data set. It's the over 120,000 people who have founded, uh, funded companies over the last 20 years. So we have all of this data over the last 20 years of everyone that's founded a high growth company. So it's not every entrepreneur broadly defined. This is sort of classic startup. And it's not just venture funding. That's one of our metrics. But if you've got some angel funding, for that matter, if you created jobs, had some patents, like if you, if it's more than you and your friends, we counted you. And so we had this huge data set and then we matched it up 
with data from the US Patent Office, the Census Bureau. Um, we have all this data on industries and individual cities. And I thought, you know what I'd love to do? Instead of just saying, look how great this city is. And you can imagine what cities might look good for uh, LGBTQ um, uh, entrepreneurship in the United States. Mm -hmm. What if we could do something different? What if we could say, uh, hey, you know, did you know that your nephew has a job? Because someone just a little bit different than you, mm -hmm. a neighbor down the street, a little bit different than you, created a company that created a job yeah. or created a patent that created a cure or brought in a funding or had an exit that changed the economics of your city. And it turns out, so we took that and I thought, let's make it even better. We want it in real time, every major metro in the United States. So every metropolitan region, uh, not just like a political city for the wonks in the room, this, these are uh, metropolitan statistical areas. So all of Silicon Valley and San Francisco and Oakland is one statistical and all of LA is one statistical, you know, an Orange County and San Bernardino. What if we looked at all the people there that created companies? And then you could see how many jobs were created by queer entrepreneurs in Boston over the last 20 years, over the last five years, how many patents were generated by lesbians in San Francisco over the last 10 years? Or what does the South look like, for that matter, for female entrepreneurship? How does it look in total? How does it look on average? How does the average entrepreneur do? And we find all of this fascinating uh, research. And right now, on, uh, you can go to SoCoast.org and you can visit the Inclusion Impact Index. Again, it's, it's a free tool. We just built it for people to use. And what's wonderful is we're having conversations with the SEC and the, the World Bank and all these others about actually leveraging this. We're having conversations, hopefully, I'm not going to name who, but big Canadian entity wants to include Canada. And the Inter-America's Bank is in talks about including all the queer founders throughout all of the Americas. Want to know how many jobs were created in Santiago over the last five years by yeah. queer entrepreneurs? By the end of the year, I intend to tell you that answer. Um, awesome. So we, we put all this together. But here's the thing that I truly wanted to say. Here's how many jobs were created. And let's take Boston, for example. I spent a lot of time looking at Boston. You might imagine sometimes it's really hard to get a hold of this. What we decided for this version of my work was we are not going to use machine learning to identify people that are queer. Yes, I can do that. Yes, if your LinkedIn is connected to me, I probably can build a machine to figure out, <laughs> but don't worry, we're not doing that. It is only voluntarily shared information. Great. Needless to say, it's been challenging getting mm -hmm. huge, you know, we have hundreds of people in the system, but our estimate is in fact, that there are thousands and thousands of high growth queer entrepreneurs operating in the United States. So for Boston, for example, we've got five people and they created uh, tens of thousands of jobs, br brought in hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, they had an impact on the world. But we've also got these very fancy statistical technique. If you're a total nerd, we have a variational MCMC algorithm inferring the hidden rate of entrepreneurship in Boston. Mm -hmm. All of those people that either just hadn't come to our attention mm -hmm. or simply not out, yeah. but almost certainly are. And we are able to infer that from all the little cues. So it turns out queer entrepreneurs in Boston over the last 20 years probably didn't create uh, tens of thousands of jobs. Mm -hmm. They probably created hundreds of thousands. And when I say probably, yeah. Our 99% confidence interval for job creation is more like 300,000 jobs. 300,000 wow. people in the Boston area had jobs mm -hmm. because people like us created countries and we didn't, we didn't just hire queer people, we hired everybody. Yeah. Thousands, tens of thousands of patents have been created by mm -hmm. queer entrepreneurs. But here's the final thing. Mm -hmm. So Boston looks kind of good. San Francisco looks pretty good. How does Indianapolis look? Dallas, not great. Mm -hmm. But what we then say is, here's what you could have been. We built this economic model, um, what's sometimes called a counterfactual model. Imagine certain things have been different, certain policies 
have been different in Indianapolis. Here's how many jobs we believe queer entrepreneurs could have generated. So actually, I'm, I'm blanking at the moment. So my, at my fingertips, I have this number. Female entrepreneurs would have added an additional 15 million jobs to the U.S. economy. Not if we just assume they performed as well as men. But in fact, probably the most accurate way of describing it is to just say, if we looked at the 10 top performing cities and we just assume everyone could do as well as that. Yeah. Yeah. Then 15 million additional jobs. Yeah. Queer entrepreneurs would have added millions of additional jobs themselves. We are now actively working on bringing Latin entrepreneurs and black entrepreneurs, refugees and dreamers, and of course, populations from all the rest of the Americas in on this. Uh, and, you know, I've got a real curiosity. Uh, in the end, I want to know what works. Mm -hmm. So our next big step for the index is actually for the mayors. It is yeah. for the economic development officers. We had a conversation with the chief economist at the New Jersey Office of Economic Development. Yeah. Uh, it's to say we're going to run essentially a huge number of experiments. Yeah. Here are the policies that would create those jobs. If you do X, you will get 1 million additional jobs over the next five years. Yeah. So we're working on that next big step right now. We've got all of the data. And now we're integrating together all this policy information. Uh, you know, it's the kind of work that only the most unrepentant policy wonk could truly love, yes. except for the payoff, <laughs> right. which is the idea that there are things our cities could do, our leaders, whether they're out queer leaders mm -hmm. or just people that want to create a job, who doesn't want that? Right. Uh, maybe I don't need as much competition for buying a house in the Berkeley Hills, but nonetheless, right. other than that, who wouldn't want another job? It just so happens the person creating the job might be a little bit different than you. And we wanted to give people a tool, no matter how much their city was struggling to support their local queer entrepreneurs, here is something you could do that, and, and I even want to give people policy options that are uncontroversial. One of the things we see very clearly in our research already is parkland. It may sound like it has nothing to do with entrepreneurship, but here's the deal. Entrepreneurs are driven by access to talent, and talent wants to live someplace special. Yeah. It turns out if you run arts programs and you create parks, special people want to come to your town, and it actually helps both migrant entrepreneurs and your own homegrown entrepreneurs find the talent that they need. So we see that already emerging out of our data. Wow. I, I Okay, so we could be spending more hours together talking about everything that you're doing. I'm just looking at all the projects that are framed on your wall. You're running out of wall space, so <laughs> it's kind I, of I've incredible. I've got uh, 12 more frames <laughs> downstairs uh, that are ready for more projects. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we'll take a picture after we're done recording. Cause I just think it's, you're doing such incredible work, Vivian. And uh, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to be here. And I learn so much from you every time. So I really appreciate it. And before we go, could you let the audience know, I know you said Sokos lab.org is that correct and so we'll have it socos.org so okay. is if you try any variant of socos you'll end up with us turns okay. out there aren't a lot of weird vivian ming mad scientists out there um, <laughs> but socos.org all okay. of the episodes of our work are there uh, you can read more about the research you can visit our tools and if you're curious you can sign up for a newsletter awesome awesome so that will all be included in the show notes Thank you so much for being on the show. For all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in this week. We're going to come back next Tuesday, same time, same place. We'll have more episodes coming to you throughout the year. And as always for now, keep showing up as authentically as you want. And we'll be in touch soon. All right. Bye. Bye.